and thank you for being here tonight. My name is Kathy Webb, and I'm the Dean of the University Libraries here at the University of Dayton, and I would like to thank you all for coming tonight. This is one of our keynote events for the Imprints and Impressions Milestones in Human Progress exhibit, and if you haven't had a chance yet to visit the exhibit, it is located on the first floor of Rash Library and will be open to the public until 10 p.m. tonight, and is usually open all the hours that the library is open. Tonight's talk is entitled, Why Stuart Rose's Collection of Rare Books Matters in the Age of Digital Surrogates. And tonight we are joined by our generous collector and supporter, Stuart Rose and his wife, Mimi. Please join me in welcoming them. And we have Stuart to thank for tonight's guest, actually, because Stuart is a member of the Board of Trustees for the Folger Library in Washington, D.C. And um, Stuart has been great, because wherever he's been going, he's been talking up the University of Dayton and the exhibit that we are putting on. And so over the summer, I think he met Dan and um, mentioned to him our exhibit. And Daniel said, oh, well, I'm a University of Dayton alum. Maybe I could come and talk during the exhibit. And so I thought we could probably make that happen, and I'm very happy that we were able to do that. So I want you all to um, settle down and settle in, and um, I think we're in for a really good conversation tonight. I'm going to take this chance to remind you to please turn off all noise-making devices. And um, for the students who are here, please uh, thank you for coming tonight, and please do plan on staying for the, quest the brief question and answer period that will happen after. Oh, I can invite someone to hear myself. That will happen after uh, we um, finish tonight's speaker. Uh, so let me tell you a little bit more, uh, more about tonight's speaker. Daniel DeSimone is the newly appointed Eric Weinman Librarian at the Folger Shakespeare Library in Washington, D.C. For the past 15 years, he served, before going to the Folger, he served as the curator for the Lessing J. Rosenwald, Rosenwald Collection at the Library of Congress. While at the Library of Congress, he was responsible for organizing a series of high-level symposia, exhibition, presentations, and publications. One of his most notable contributions was the exhibition entitled A Heavenly Craft, The Woodcut and Early Printed Books that had been used in New York City, Dallas, and Washington, and was accompanied by a highly acclaimed exhibition catalog of the same name. In addition, he has organized symposia and written on such diverse topics as Galileo, techniques of color printing, William Blake, early calligraphy books, and many other subjects which relate to the Rosenwald collection. Before his appointment as Rosenwald coordinator, a curator, Daniel owned his own bookselling business, which he operated for 22 years in New York City. Focusing his business on selling to rare book libraries, he developed specialties in the history of printing, antiquarian bibliography, book illustration, and 18th century Italian and French books. In 2006, he was awarded the Krasnoff Grant, which funded his research on the history of printing in Ferrara, and in 2005, and again in 2008, he received the Library of Congress Special Achievement Award. He has received recognition of his peers both in the United States and Europe, and is an elected member of the Grolier Club in New York City. And I'm going to bang, mangle this French, so, I pre so I'm, I'm saying I'm sorry now. Association Internationale des Bibliophiles in Paris, and the Print Council of America. He received his bachelor's degree from Clark University in Worcester, Mass, and a master's degree in history, when we had a history master's degree, um, at the, from the University of Dayton. So please join me in welcoming Dan. Thank you very much. Um, it's interesting coming back after nearly 40 years uh, to see a, a campus transformed. Um, but I could tell that the spirit's very similar to the spirit uh, that I remember when I was here. So that's a very nice thing to, to, uh, uh, to feel. Um, I'd like to thank Stuart, Rose, his wife Mimi, my hero of the moment, and my new friend uh, Kathy Webb, Dean of the University Libraries, for this opportunity to speak to the faculty, the staff, the students, and friends of the University of Dayton. As you've been told, I graduated with an MA 40 years ago. It's hard for me to believe that. And having received this invitation, my memory has been stimulated to recall those days and to try and remember the people and the places that propelled me forward. 
Um, though my destination was unknown at the time, I left here prepared in a way I didn't understand until challenged. Although I've been back only once since May of 1974, I've been following the development of University of Dayton, mostly through my friends from the 1970s, people who love Dayton and who are still in touch with me. When I was here, there was a graduate program in history, a full staff, and a student body that was torn apart by the war in Vietnam and Richard Nixon. It was also a time of the big red machine led by Rose and Bench, and also Donnie Smith and Mike Sylvester, who brought the flyers close to the promised land. This campus was alive and well and doing what it was supposed to do, encouraging inquiry, teaching tolerance, facing the big issues, and retaining its integrity. A lot of places didn't. I used to joke about being high much of the time that I was here and suggest that I would recall only the purple haze of smoke and the smell of beer, but my career tells a different story. I learned how to think like a historian, although in truth I never became one. I learned to work with original documents like those housed in the seminary of the United Brethren of Christ here in Dayton and write a paper based on evidence gleaned from original sources as well as learning the critical apparatus that surrounded the documents. It was also during this time that I first learned to trust my instincts, my gut reaction to events and people, and it has served me very well over these many years. So before beginning this presentation, I'd like to pay a tribute to the history department of so many years ago. Here, in alphabetical order, is my role of honor, my testimony to the faces that I still see in my mind's eye, my memories of the department and that did their best to suggest to me how to go about it. Alexander, Bannon, Beauregard, Donatelli, Ide, King, Maris, Palermo, Ree, Ruppel, and Soffer. As you've been told, I'm the Weinman librarian at the Folger Shakespeare Library. The Folger is an independent research library. It was founded by gift of a collection of about 60,000 books and manuscripts, which now is about 250,000 books and about 70,000 manuscripts, including 40, uh, 84, 82 first folios. Um, along with the collection came a building and an endowment which covers about 60% of the operating costs um, of the Folger Shakespeare Library. All this was donated by a private collector by the name of Henry Clay Folger. He was president of Standard Oil of New York and the right-hand man of Rockefeller. Henry K. Clay Folger and his wife, Emily, spent about 40 years building and planning the library, beginning, of course, with Shakespeare, but expanding to cover early modern England to the death of Queen Anne in 1714. And then, again, another collection of early modern Europe covering the Renaissance and the development of the modern state and culture. The collection includes books, pamphlets, documents, manuscripts, paintings, and engravings. Folger accomplished this by following the antiquarian book market as if it were the Dow Jones Industrial Average. He worked very closely with the book trade, meeting booksellers from around the world. He studied their catalogs. His wife managed much of this part of the business. And he built his collection very privately so that no one knew exactly what he was doing, so that he could build quietly and then make the gift to the nation. Before going to the Folger, I worked for another great collector, collector, Lessing J. Rosenwall. And I was a curator at Library of Congress for nearly 15 years. This is a, another collection. It was established about the graphic arts. And it covered six centuries, covering all of Western Europe. And it showed the development of early printed books the development of the book illustration process from the woodcut to the engraving, all the way to the livre d'artistes of the French period of the post-war. I didn't realize it until yesterday how much Stewart's collection resembled Rosenwald's. Looking at those books, I saw many familiar titles, especially in the sciences, 
and many of the books for, uh, that, that, that would, were part of the Rosenwald collection I also saw um, last evening at, at, um, at Stewart's. At the Library of Congress, I also became involved with the Jefferson Collection and many of the other individual collections that were built by private collectors and either donated or sold to the Library of Congress. So I come to this experience of visiting the Rose Collection with, with a lot of information. I met Stuart for the first time earlier this year. He, as you have come to learn, is legendary in the field of rare books. I had been hearing about him for about two decades, especially about his purchases at auction. We have many friends in common, so I was not unknown to him, but, um, but we had never met. I cannot tell you how excited I was to find out that he was a member of the Board of Governors of the Folger Shakespeare Library when I took the job there. When we finally met, I realized that Stuart was a very nice man with a voracious appetite for books who happened to live in Dayton, Ohio. As we got talking, he told me how much he loved UD and about the exhibition that was being planned to showcase his books to the Dayton community. He also told me about the excitement over the exhibition that was being generated on the campus. Faculty, students were looking at this as a teaching moment and all the stops were being pulled out in order to take advantage of this enormous opportunity. I can tell you, if you don't already know, this made Stuart very happy and a happy Stuart is a good thing. I knew that uh, Nicholas Basbanes was coming here to speak and that he would be placing Stewart's collection in a context. And I read Mer uh, Meredith Moss' informative article in the da Dayton Daily News describing Stewart and the exhibition. I examined the catalog that was prepared by the faculty, looked with care at the online exhibition that was on the website. All agreed that this was a fabulous collection, heralding what was best and most important in the history of human thought and endeavor. Just by examining the 50 books on display in the Royce Library, one can find the most important work, books in the field of early printing, philosophy, science, art, literature, that cover six centuries as well and, and from all over Western Europe and the United States. There is a Book of the Dead from the first century, a Sutra from the eighth century, a Beethoven manuscript, a Salvador Dali's images of Alice. But you're aware of all this, and some of you have had a chance to write the commentary on the collection, and I hope that all of you have had a chance to read it, either in the catalog or in the descriptions which accompany the exhibition. Given this state of affairs, I had to ask myself, what was I going to speak about? To answer this question, I did what I've been trained to do. I looked at what was missing in what I read. I looked to the negative space, searching for what was unspoken, what was missing, apparent to my eye yet undetected by others who'd been writing and speaking about the Stuart, uh, Stuart's books. Let's think about negative space. Think about a piece of type. A letter form is carved into the tip of a very hard piece of metal. It is filed and cleaned and then punched into a more malleable piece of metal called a matrix leaving an imprint. A letter is then cast by pouring lead into the matrix resulting in a piece of metal with a letter design in relief raised to sit on a tiny platform that is the body of a piece of type. This letter would be joined by other pieces of type set into a line tied into a form and placed on a bed of a press inked and then printed. Think of a letter that resembles the lowercase d. You have a vertical line bumped out with a circle on its left flank. The space around the line, the bump out, and the interior of the circle is negative. It's missing. It's a void. But the negative space is as critical to the formation of the letter as are the lines and the circle. It is here that I've learned to look for clues for the evidence that is not obvious but essential to understanding a given problem. As I read, as I read what was being written about Stewart's collection, I looked for what was missing knowing that if I discovered it, I could then begin to think about the implications of what I found. I began by examining the catalog list of Stewart's entire collection. If you haven't seen it, it's a printed list of about an inch thick, filled with over 2,000 titles, organized by author, title, date, and pu of publication, 
with many descriptions containing information about the binding and some of the special aspects of the books. And finally, there is mention of the book's provenance. I broke it down into its component parts, attempted to better uh, attempting to better understand the scope of the, co the collection. Now hold your breath, because I'm going to go over a lot of material in a very short period of time, because I have a point to make. Briefly, what I found is in addition to the Book of the Dead and the Sutra, the collection contains 16 medieval manuscripts ranging from theological texts to astronomy to illuminated books of hours. Over the past 20 years, Rose has purchased 95 incunables, that is, books printed before 1501, which document the spread of printing from Mainz throughout Western Europe to England. In this group, there is a leaf from the Gutenberg Bible considered um, uh, printed, uh, printed in Mainz circa 1455, and Stuart told me that if he had an opportunity, he'd buy a complete one one day. It also has a Columbus letter printed in Rome in 1493, which describes Columbus's first voyage and the discovery of territory for the Spanish crown. An edition of Aquinas printed in the early years of the 1460s. Numerous titles printed in Venice by Aldus Manutius. First printings of classical authors like Aristotle, Cicero, Dante, Euclid, Josephus, Plato, Ptolemy, and Seneca, the texts of the Church Fathers, treatise by alchemists and astronomers, and a number of editions telling the story of chivalry and romance of the medieval court. Early science is also an extremely important part of the collection. In addition to Galileo, Stewart's collection contains seminal works by Kepler, Tycho Brahe, Pacioli, Ramelli, Reggio Montanus, and Vesalius. In the 17th century, he purchased the works of Ortelius, Spinoza, Theodore de Bray, Moliere, Montaigne, Rabelais, Shakespeare, Milton, and Dunn. Just about every notable English and French author of the 18th century is included in multiple editions, as well as a stunning, and I really mean stunning, collection of 19th century French authors, from Balzac to Baudelaire to Dumas to Flaubert, Hugo Proust, and Zola. In addition, he has all the major 19th century Russian novelists in original condition. As for England, Stewart's collections collected original edition, editions of the novels by Dickens, Eliot, Hardy, Thackeray, and Trollope, the romantic poems of Keats, Shelley, Coleridge, and Tennyson, the works of Lewis Carroll, Kipling, Rossetti, Wells, and Wilde, and the 20th century writers like D.H. Lawrence, Forster, Virginia Woolf, and Ian Fleming. Besides the founding fathers, all the 19th century American authors are present. Cooper, Irving, Hawthorne, Emerson, Poe, Thoreau, Whitman, Alcott, Stowe, Henry James, Twain, Crane, Dunbar, and Zane Grey, to name the most prominent. For the 20th century, the collection of American first editions is extraordinary. Represented by Faulkner, Fitzgerald, Frost, Heller, Hemingway, O'Neill, Salinger, Steinbeck, Wolfe, Thomas Wolfe, and um, Tennessee Williams. This is just an outline, and I apologize, Stuart, for those authors which I've left out. As Stuart told me, he's attempting to purchase every author of note and every book of consequence that came into the market over the past 20 years and he'll continue to follow this strategy for as long as he's able. He concentrates on the best copies available in the market, upgrading when he finds a better copy or a more interesting copy, focusing especially on inscribed and annotated books and manuscripts, copies in original condition or important bindings, and of course those copies with important provenance that have come to him from other major collections. I particularly like the idea that he's collecting what is available at a given point in time. Although any collection that is built demonstrates this characteristic, I've never heard of anyone who consciously has looked at the market and said, I will buy what is available if it is a known author and it's an important copy. A strategy like this clearly makes a statement about the tastes and connoisseurship of the rare book market at a given point in time. And I can tell you from a bibliographical point of view, this is a powerful statement. Its power comes from the fact that when someone like me begins to examine a collection, 
a certain series of questions are asked, not about the author or the title or the context necessarily, as these are traditional, traditionally been the prerogative of academics like the, the information that appears in the catalog imprints and impressions that was so beautifully produced for this exhibition. I look for effort, evidence that can be found by a close examination of the object. I'm totally committed to learning about who put their money into the project of publication. Printing is a business. So I asked the question, was this the idea of the printer himself, or was it, was it commissioned by the church, or perhaps by the court, or by an author desperate to see his works in print? I asked who the printer was and where did he learn his craft. I want to know about the, this publication and how it fits into his career, and I want to know who purchased his types, his press, his initial letters, his woodcuts, and his graving after he ceased to printing. I examined printing types, layouts, and quality of printing on the printed page. I ask, is it leg legible? Or is it a, a piece of job printing that helped keep the doors of the printing shop open? I want to know who designed the type. And I look for the influences that I can identify from earlier letter forms that are incorporated into the fonts used in the printing text. This is a kind of an example of what I spend my time doing, or used to before I left the, uh, left the Library of Congress by looking at three printers, the Spira from Venice, Jensen from Venice, and Belfortis from, from uh, Ferrara, you're able to see actually the evolution of letter forms until we get to Jensen, which is probably the most sublime of the f letter forms printed in Venice. I study the format of the book. Is it a folio? Is it a quarto, a duodecimo, recognizing that this will tell me a great deal about the audience the printer is making this book for, and more about the market for expensive and cheap books that dictate the choices made by the printer. These are all represented in Stuart's collection. And this is important because by handling the book and seeing the book, you learn so much about who produced this book. It's hard to do online. It's hard to do from Ebo. It's hard to do from a digitized image. So it's one of the reasons why I really always want to handle the book because it provides me with an enormous amount of information, uh, not only about the content, but how the book was produced and who it was produced for. I want to know the quality of the paper that was used. What are the watermarks? What can they tell me where the paper, uh, what do they tell me about where the paper came from? The Po River Valley or a vill uh, village off the Rhine? Knowing this will tell me a great deal about the cost of production as paper was the most expensive material used in the printing process. And I think Basmanes talked quite a bit about paper when he was here. I look at the book to determine the kind of binding that, um, that, uh, that protects the, the text block. I ask whether it is original or whether it was bound at a later date. Can I date the binding by the materials that were used or by examining the sewing structure that was executed by the binder? which in most cases tell me, tells me from which tradition it came and where the, binding was, where the binding was from. To identify many of the books that are bound, I look to the finishing of the binding, the identifying the ornamentation that was used to decorate the covers. I want to know if the binding has been prepared, or excuse me, has been repaired. Um, if I think it has, I try to determine when and where and whether the text has been tampered with during the repair process perhaps by inserting a missing leaf or removing a plate or a map. One of the skills that I've worked very hard to develop is learning the process of how book illustrations were designed, translated to a woodblock or a copper plate, and then printed. The illustrated book combines all the elements of printing process and has the added layer of information that speaks to the reader in its own language, that is line, shading, form, and color. So this is a woodcut. You can see it's rather crudely produced. It's an English woodcut, but it was done in the German style. And this is probably the most sublime scientific illustration that was ever produced. It's from Sidereus Nuncius, Galileo's book of 1610. And what you have is what he represents here are the moons of Jupiter. So you have Jupiter here. And then you have the four moons that are off to the sides of the, plan of the planet. And this was done 
in, Jan in December of 1610. Um, uh, a few days later, through the telescope, he observed the planet and he observed the, and recorded the positions of the, uh, positions of the um, images. A few days later, he observes the planet and then he s makes another notation of where he sees he sees the, the, um, the moon. Without saying so, what he's done here is he's shown motion. He's shown the motion of the planet around um, uh, Jupiter. And why this is important, because the Catholic Church and all of science, at least uh, uh, much of science at that time, considered the universe stationary, that there was no motion that was perfect. And so without saying so, what he was able to demonstrate through his, his, his methods of observation was motion in the universe, which was to become an extremely important part of the development of the uh, heliocentric uh, concept um, after Kepler. These are woodcuts. This is a, an engraving. And This is, um, this is the original drawing. And this is a, a, on, on copper plate. So you can see the transition, the translation that's taking place from the original pencil drawing until it's made into a cop, cut into a copper plate and then printed. So these are a very important part of my career, uh, studying these types of things. And a very important aspect of the whole printing process and the printed book. This is William Blake. Um, uh, this is an engraving for, from Blake. Blake's, the content of Blake's material was totally unique in, in the history of book illustration. He not only produced, he was not only a master engraver, but he did re reverse um, relief printing for many of his illuminated books. So he not only was able to do fine engraving, he developed a whole new process of printing images. As you can see, when I look at Stewart's book, my first impulse is to look for evidence that speaks to me of the process of production. I then look for the information that tells me about the life of the book. I ask who owned it. Are there marks on the end papers that carry a book plate or an ex libris? Does it have an owner's inscription on the title page? Are there telltale signs that tell me which bookseller or auction house owned or handled the book over the ages? Is the book inscribed to someone? Are there annotations in the text which may indicate a period of time in which this copy was read and perhaps some indication of who, the, who that person was, at least in terms of profession, if not specifically by name? If so, I ask, what do these annotations tell me about what was important to this reader at a given period of time? So the history of the book is not only about its influence on human thought, but it's about the people who made it who owned it, who read it, and who were influenced by it. This is a much bigger picture that explores questions about human interaction, about the everyday life of those who produced the object, and those who consumed it and then passed it on. Let me provide an insight that may help explain this idea. Of all the trades and the professions that have come down to us since the medieval period, say for the past thousand years, the production of the Codex Manuscript and then the printed book is the most documented process in human history. Its evidence is everywhere. By studying the production of the book and the elements which I have outlined above, scholars have the opportunity to go beyond the big picture of the big idea and focus their attention on the people who use the object, a part of the historical record that calls out to scholars to pay more attention. Focusing on the history of the book makes the humanities relevant to each and every one of us as it attempts to explain, based on evidence, an aspect of humanity during a given period of time that in the past has not been considered. A growing revolution in the academy is slowly taking place with the evolution of a new discipline called history of the book. Today there are accredited academic programs at the University of Edinburgh, London, Amsterdam, Toronto, Mainz, Nuremberg, Munster, and here in the States at Drew University and Texas Technical University, to name the most prominent. 
These programs are being driven by new research techniques that have been developed with database technology. Scholars in this field are in a sense reverting to the 19th century thesis developed in Germany that focused on the individual word and its function. Philology is making a comeback because the databases facilitate the codification, the tagging, and the cross-referencing that allows scholars to make connections that would be nearly impossible without the ability to sort information. So scholars are mining texts. They're transcribing and tagging manuscripts and annotated books and placing unprecedented emphasis on readership, ownership, and the language that was used that in the language that tells as much about the reception of the book by those who consumed it as it does about the importance of the text in the pantheon of human thought. I have more to say on this subject, but I hope that I've made my point. And now uh, let's move on to why Stewart's collection is important. Why should we pay attention to this collection and this collector when all or most of these texts are available online or in cheap editions printed by demand by Amazon or any num number of outlets. Let me begin by saying that because of my nearly 40 years experience with old books, I'm not in awe of this collection when I saw the catalog because honestly, I've handled many of the copies and titles um, at one time or another during my career. Not the same copies, of course, but I'm not exaggerating when I say hundreds of thousands of books have passed through my hands. This allows me to think about the, not about the aura surrounding the library or to see it as a trophy case of human thought, but rather as a series of objects that in themselves can instruct and be useful resources for better understanding questions about the human condition which are yet to be examined. If we accept to be true that evidence found by the study of the individual book is important, and if we agree that the description of Stewart's strategy for building a collection represented, represents what is available at a given point in time, then it must follow that this collection is not only a document that describes an essential aspect of late 20th and early 21st century book market, but it also contains those elements that are essential to the new methods of research and offer scholars opportunities to mine information about readers and the use of books. Stewart's collection contains provenance information, annotations, author's corrections, and manuscript notes. Much of this information is unpublished, unrecorded, and until recently misunderstood. But it now can be, but is now considered essential for the taking of the next step in the quest for understanding more about what it is to be human by linking thought to the, uh, to the human being who wrote it down, printed, purchased, recorded it, and pass these reactions along to the next generation of readers who, in many cases, did the same. This is what can be found in the books that Stewart has brought together. It is the value added that goes beyond the conceptual and reflects the lives of the people who produced, owned, read, interacted with texts, and the great minds that produced them. Thank you very much. Um, yes, um, it was my responsibility to um, make sure uh, that when I was buying books that the books came from um, reputable booksellers in most cases or auction houses and that my job was to make sure that the description of what they provided um, was reflected in the book that uh, we were purchasing. So. I return books sometimes, um, not because of authentic uh, uh, reasons of authenticity, mostly its condition, that it wasn't described properly, that um, the, the, you know, the binding wasn't right, or they misinterpreted some aspect of the book that I may have known a little bit more about. Um, so I did return books, yes.
Well, I, I would look at it this way. Regardless of whether it was a person of historical significance, if someone in a 13th century manuscript is commenting on the text, that's important because it gives us an insight into people's thoughts, a reader's thought is at a given uh, um, point in time. The type of research that's being done now, um, we at the Folger, we're doing a program where we're, uh, we've got a paleographer who works for us. She's extremely talented, um, uh, reading sec English secretarial type from the 17th century. So we're taking our 17th century English manuscripts, um, we're digitizing them, we're coding them, uh, we're transcribing them, and we're coding them with a, uh, a tagging device which helps us determine parts of speech and maybe rep repetition. And then we're crowdsourcing that information so that other scholars from around the country can take a look at the transcriptions that have been done and, and make additions to it or corrections and so forth. This is, we're doing that at the Folger. The Newberry is doing it for Italian texts. The Huntington Library on the West Coast is doing it for French texts. So this, this uh, and, and um, so there's a lot of work, and, and I'm sure there's many, many other institutions that are taking a look at these an annotations and attempting to transcribe, um, transcribe them and translate them so that they become useful information for scholars to study. Well, um, if I follow the question, um, you've got labor was not so expensive. You've got type that you could use again and again and again. So the cost of it over time could be amortized. But paper was that object which you had to use it and pay for it and you didn't get a chance to use it again. So it was the most expensive piece. So. Um, um, if, if I was an author and I had some poems I wanted to, I would go to a bookseller and hire the bookseller to print the book. And I think that happens today in academia all the time. Um, that the, a, lot of, a lot of things are financed through uh, self-financing. So yes, um, uh, authors did that quite often. And they would pay the printer in order to do it. If you were lucky enough, by the, ninth, by the 18th century, publishing was developed to such a point where that they actually were paying authors. But lots of times, especially in the 17th century, there was very little income that was generated uh, for the authors. It was a different reason for having something published. Could you speak a little on the difficulties of the problems of digitizing that work time? Yeah. Um, so what, what they're doing is, I mean, this is an Italian text. I think this is the, um, this is the commentary on Aristotle. The anonymous commentary. Yeah. yeah. So this is, the, this is um, and this would be digitized, and then it would be, a, and they've got now programs so that you could have the digitized text here, and then there's a, a space in order to do the transcription. So someone would, someone would uh, translate it into English, for instance. And then what they're doing is they're using electronic tagging devices which would break it down by part of speech. And so that you would know all the, uh, all the um, nouns, pronouns, and so forth. And in, in a document like this, there's probably a lot of um, um, abbreviations. And so those abbreviations would be defined. And so if you saw it as you, um, you know, th throughout the text, it would become repetitive. Um, but, but then this, this, uh, this uh, manuscript would then be sourced so that you would put it on a, a database and there would be a lot of people who were academics or gra a lot of graduate students actually who were doing the analysis of these, of these texts. And this would be an example of, of and, and this, this somebody at, I think, I think somebody at the Newberry would be very pleased to be able to handle a text like this. Yes, ma'am.
Yeah, um, I come with a really strong bias. I think that the book is a perfect object. And so I will defend the book. <laughs> I'll defend the book. And so I, and I really think that it's so perfect that human beings really react to it. I have no fear that the book is going to disappear. Um, and I think especially books um, of the caliber that are downstairs in the exhibition hall. And I think what we're trying to do and I think what, you know, the whole digital humanities, part of what the whole digital humanities is about, is an attempt to use the technology and, um, in order to bring the potential source of information back to the public eye from the original documents. So, you know, it's a big subject. I don't know anything about technology. And I just know what I see my staff doing and what the Institute at the Folger Library is doing, and I'm reading as much as I can because this is all new to me. I, I, you know, I've never done any data mining. Um, I've never done any type of research like that. But there's a lot of people that do now, and especially the younger uh, um, scholars who are coming in. I mean, their technological, their, tech, their skills in technology are enormous, and they're really able to redefine how research is taking place. And institutions like mine have to respond. We have to respond to the demands of this younger generation of scholars who are moving up and who, are, who demand this kind of uh, access to materials. We're also using them, in a sense, by putting together grants where we you know, uh, offer them opportunities to use, the, use our, our, uh, um, our books and manuscripts um, so that they can then test their skills and better the, themselves in the use of technology and at the same time dealing with subjects which are important to us in the humanities. Hi, Pat. So, so I agree that the book is perfect. Book, books have been born from the earliest printed books, the mass produced books by the end of the 19th century. You went to college at the paperback revolution that transformed reading and how you use the science. So when you look at that transformation again and again, uh, how do you see that impact in all right, uh, the book as technology? In the book, I think you're kind of just thinking about it as a kind of epistemology, too, if I read you right. Yeah. So, so do you think about this transformation from the original printed book to the mass produced? Oh, yeah, I, I think about it all the time because when you're, in, you, when you're dealing with a collection, you're seeing, especially a collection that's built over time, you're seeing examples you know, of, um, of finely bound books or books that are in wrappers, original publishers' wrappers, or think about the graphic art novels that have been coming out over the last 10 years. I mean, you know, Lynn Ward did that in the 30s, and then uh, you know, no one did it again until you know, year 2000. Um, so there's a whole, I'm watching that all the time, and yet it's still, you know, uh, sheets of paper with text on them, with a spine and wrappers, you know, it's still in the codex format. And um, also there's a whole movement of fine press books that, um, so, so printers, people who, are, who um, have uh, an interest in typography or in book binding, there's a lot of people that are doing this. Um, University of Iowa has a very good program in paper making. Um, University uh, te uh, Texas A&M has this, they teach printing, uh, you know. So there's a lot of activity that's going on um, uh, at, at the same time that this, you know, the, the form of the book is changing, being transformed. There's a lot of activity and it's a very interesting. I mean, when, when I was in college, you know, it was this late 60s and then and into the 70s, you know, it was all about alternative, let's do alternative stuff. And so there was a lot of people that were, you know, dropping out and going to communes and doing, and, but also taking up the crafts. So there's a whole movement of fine printers who are now our age, who, you know, been, been producing books, you know, for as long as I've been, you know, looking at books. So, um, and, and it's a big body of material. Yes, sir. Uh, you said by like all of your examinations of the books, you can tell like where the book came from, like the origins of it, and like what it went 
through. What's the advantage of reading like an original transcript and like finding all that out as opposed to reading the book online, just Googling where it came from yeah. and like what happened to it? Well, I think it, it, there's more to a book than its content. And so that if a book is printed, you know, the, the book on this, you know, this, this catalog cover here, it's printed, um, it's printed, say, in 1460, and it contains the text of Aquinas. Um, there's, there's a whole history of how this book was put together, and it informs you of the period in which it was done. So that's really the, the sensitivity that the humanities is about. It's this continuum of experience over time. And it's not that the text that you read on Google or, you know, um, is, it's not a question about the text necessarily. It's really a text about, it's really a question about the information that is um, inherent in the object, which will bring to you, bring you more information about not only the text, but also the period in which the text was presented. So that's really a, an important aspect which can be lost. And I think that's what many of the digital scholars and the historians of the book are grasping at now, trying to bring that back into, into, into context so that we have a broader understanding of what, uh, of what these, this information uh, really means in its totality. Thank you very much.